Hello everyone, can you hear me okay? Awesome, thank you. So my name is Vince Salvino. I am with uh, Code Red. We're a Cleveland-based uh, tech firm that does web development, and we use a lot of Python and Django. So um, I wanted to do a little talk about containers, uh, specifically Docker. It's this sort of magic technology, and I'm, you know, I don't know if you've anyone in this room has ever seen a, a demo of like Docker or Kubernetes or any of these, you know, hot technologies where it's just you see this command prompt and you have a hello world app and then all of a sudden you have like a thousand hello world apps and it's like oh my god this is so cool and oh, what just happened I don't even know I don't even know what I'm looking at but I'm amazed um, and, then, and that's how I felt and uh, it's kind of a confusing thing so as a Python developer I wanted to do a little walkthrough of what I've learned so far about containers and how that sort of relates to technologies that we're already familiar with and how we can uh, you know decide if we want to use it and start using it in our Python development. Uh, slides are online. Uh, you can just download the PDF if you're interested. I'm also on Twitter. I usually tweet when I'm at tech conferences and then go silent for like six months. So, <laughs> so let's just start off. What is a container? The common answer, at least for me, is just dark magic. It's this great thing that everybody wants, but I don't really know. And uh, you know, you'll see these uh, these Docker demos, and it's like all you have to do is apt get install Docker, Docker run hello world. Wow, all this stuff is happening. I don't really know what it means, but I can uh, see the word hello world on my screen, so that must be good. The real answer is a container is really just a bundle. It's sort of a binary. It's something that you can ship besides just your code. So the idea behind containers is that you will bundle all of your software and your code and system dependencies into one single package and that whole entire thing gets shipped. So there are similar concepts, but a container has a lot less overhead and a lot less dependency than an entire virtual machine. So like you could bundle your whole app and an entire VM with an OS and everything, but that's just a lot of overhead. Alternatively, we have pip, which has a requirements.txt, and you can sort of specify your dependencies, but uh, something like a container gives you way more control than just uh, pip packages. So, okay, that's nice. Why should I care? Uh, let's just talk about running a Python app normally. Okay, so probably everyone in this room uses pip. You pip install your requirements. You run your app with Python, cool, it worked, all my dependencies are somewhat managed through requirements.txt. Uh, but wait, what version of Python am I using on my system? Is it 2.7? Is it 3.3? I don't really know. Is it 3.7? Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, something in my requirements.txt uh, conflicts with a different version. I can only really run one app on my system. If I try and run two, and one needs a different version of Python than the other, or one needs a different version of some uh, pip package than another, the whole thing just breaks. So uh, this really isn't the greatest. And then the gods created Virtually Envy. And we're like, oh, wow, this is awesome. You know, when I first learned about Virtually Envy, it was like the greatest thing ever. And now I can run different versions of Python on the same system. And uh, I can run different versions of all my pip packages in separate virtual environments on the same system. Wow, this is great. Um, but the gods were still not pleased. For instance, my system only comes with two versions of Python. One version of Python 2, one version of Python 3. So what are my options? Well, I can live with it. I can go on Stack Overflow and try to compile a different version of Python for my system. Uh, you know, that'll go over great in prod. I could install some kind of binary or a PPA from you know something on that I found on the internet, but do I really want to do that to get Python 3.6? I don't know. Uh, another uh, issue is my app needs a system library installed. So this is not something that pip can do. I can't pip install Apache, right? Um, classic example is my SQL client. To get my SQL client, you have to have all these system dependencies. So, 
has anyone ever seen this on Stack Overflow? Well, on Fedora, you need to install this. And on Ubuntu, you need to install this. But it doesn't work with this version, so you have to use a different version. Or my favorite is fools, your app should only be pure Python. So some tried to please the gods by sacrificing resources to virtual machines. But no one really wants to deal with virtual machines. I mean, why have we resorted to creating an entire OS image just to run our nice, lean, light Python app? Um, you know, just bloatware galore. Now I need uh, two gigabytes of memory and a 20 gigabyte disk just to run my Python. You know, this is not the answer. So the gods created containers. But actually, this concept has been around a while. BSD joke there for any BSD users. Um, BSD has actually had a similar concept for a while. Um, containers essentially let you specify a collection of system packages, code, files, environment variables, whatever you want. And all of that will run natively on the OS, not virtualized in a VM. So in a sense, it's kind of like virtually NV for your entire OS. So just to recap the question, that's nice, why should I care? Well, there's a few reasons. If you've ever needed a different version of Python than what your system had, if you've ever had trouble installing a system dependency, if you've ever um, tried to install your app on multiple systems or maybe multiple apps on one system because say you need to run three or four different apps and you don't want to have to spin up three or four separate VMs for that. Um, or maybe you want to easily and simply distribute a working version of your app to others. Uh, you want to create a demo app and distribute it or you have uh, some sort of uh, app that you want to distribute to your customers but you don't want them to have to learn how to make a build environment just to run your app then you might care about containers. So cool, but how do these containers actually work? Well, let's start with virtually NV. This is sort of like the basic level of containerization in, in a sense. Um, virtually NV only works with Python and it only handles pip packages, so other Python libraries, but the way it would work is you can specify a specific version of, in this case, Django, Wagtail, Maybe you don't really care what version of MySQL client, so you're just going to use the latest. Um, great. I've sort of got a snapshot of what my dependencies are. But wouldn't it be really cool if you could do this? Um, pip install Apache version 2.4. Pip install Python version 3.6. Pip install mod WSGI, mod redirect, uh, image magic um, uh, to process your images on the back end. As a Python developer, I would love to be able to do this. But we do have this already. It's called containers. Uh, LXC or Docker are two specific uh, container technologies I'm going to look at really quick. So uh, LXC is Linux containers. Um, there's some underlying differences to how these work, but LXC basically uses kind of like a mini OS, a very lightweight mini OS, that it does run natively using the host's kernel. So it's not a virtual machine, but it, it's similar experience to using a virtual machine. Docker takes a different view, and it views it more as only your application. So it's very portable. Any system that can run Docker can run your app. Um, you know, it, it only includes exactly what you need. It doesn't include an entire OS along with it. Um, and your software dependencies are sort of handled by Docker behind the scenes, so you don't have to worry about the nitty gritty of how do you install multiple versions of everything. So let's think in terms of a LAMP stack, which I'm sure many of us work with, you know, Linux, Apache, uh, MySQL, and PHP, Python, Perl, et cetera. So let's just think about our LAMP app, okay? We, um, we have a predefined OS image, uh, Debian 8, Ubuntu, uh, CentOS, whatever you use. And you say, okay, now I need to install uh, the system dependencies, so image magic, I need libmysql client dev so that I can build my wheel. Um, I need a version of Python. My, S, my OS probably only comes with a certain version, and it may be difficult to install a different version outside of that, so I have to pick you know, what I'm given. Now I'm going to install virtually NV, so I can use that. And uh, now I need to install Apache or Nginx or whatever 
um, that you're going to use. And now I need to set up mod WSGI, uh, jump through some hoops, create a virtual env, make sure everything starts on boot. Um, you know, has anyone ever done this? Yeah, tried to. I love that. Uh, now, once all that's done, I can copy my code to the server and actually start running my app. So there's a lot to do here. It's not something that you want to reproduce frequently. Okay. So let's think about this same experience in terms of Docker. I'm going to, before I install anything or build anything or set anything up, I'm just going to predefine an image that includes what I want. Then I'm going to predefine where my code goes and sort of preload my code in a sense. Then I'm going to predefine, okay, when this whole thing starts up, what do I want it to do first? Maybe that's start Apache, maybe that's run a Python file. Then once I have all of this stuff defined, I'll say, okay, Docker run. You know, here's everything you need, just go and do the whole thing all at once. So my Docker image will now run exactly the same on any OS. Uh, the, pen the dependencies are sort of, uh, have been predefined and will be managed through Docker. Um, instead of being managed by the OS and saying, oh, the OS only has this version, you know, this OS has a different config layout than this other OS, um, or having to have a sys sysadmin manually do this stuff for you. So let's sort of visualize the LAMP stack. If this is a, a, an OS, you'd have the kernel. You'd have a bunch of your system dependencies. Um, you'd have the apps that you want to install in gray, and those would be you know, installed from the system, from the you know, apt get, whatever your system package manager is, yum. And then you would have your code that you put into this uh, stack. With Docker, it's a little bit different. So you're sort of in capsule. You still have the kernel, and you still have a system dependency that is Docker but you're sort of shipping an entire image of what your app needs. That might include WSGI, that might include Python, that might include Apache. It would certainly include your own app code as well, but you're shipping an entire uh, sort of frozen state of everything. So let's do a little quick start here. What would this actually look like in real life? So let's say I have a Python app, and for now I just have a couple files in my uh, my app directory. <clears throat> Very creative name, uh, myapp.py and requirements.txt. This should look familiar to everyone. Now I'm going to add a Docker file. So let's Dockerize this Python app. Think of the Docker file as the requirements.txt for your entire system. So inside of this Docker file, um, I can pull from other Docker images, and uh, there's thousands of them out there. So I'm going to pull in Python 3.6. I could pull in any version of Python I wanted. Then I'm going to copy my code into a specific directory that I'm calling code. Then I'm going to install uh, my requirements.txt. I don't really need to use virtual ENVs in here because this container is already its own isolated thing. And finally, once everything is set up, once I have Python 3.6 and once I have my requirements.txt all available, I'm going to run this command that is Python my app. So I'm going to run my app. Now keep in mind this is a little bit more of a simple example. Uh, you might be using something like, you know, uwsgi. If you had uh, something other than Python, like a WordPress, you might need Apache and PHP and a couple other dependencies in here. So it might get a little bit more complicated. Um, your final command might actually be to just start Apache. It might not be to run Python. But um, this, uh, you can predefine everything here in this Docker file. So, uh, now we just created a Docker file. I mean, that, de that defines everything. It's like similar to the requirements.txt for our whole system. 
Now we're going to build a Docker image, and the Docker image is sort of like the static binary that has everything in it that we need. So this is where you would run Docker build, you would name your image, I'm going to call it my app image. So now I have this sort of uh, uh, single package of all of Python 3.6, of all my requirements.txt, it's all frozen in time into one single executable. So this might be a little bit big, you know, this might be several hundred megabytes or something because it has everything that you need in it. Uh, this is the same command, so yeah, this one command just basically provisions everything. Um, it's a binary, you can think of it on Windows like an EXE, right? You download an EXE and that EXE kind of comes with everything that it needs to run. It's not like, oh, I have an EXE and now I need to install all these other things and I need to install an interpreter and I need to install, uh, you know, the, the whole thing's bundled. And when you run it, it tells the system exactly what to execute. So it's all dockerized. Now we have this my app image that I just built. Uh, what am I going to do with that? Well, I'm going to do docker run my image and it's going to execute everything exactly how I predefined it. So uh, going back to the beginning, this was the one of the first slides I show of sort of the dark magic where you see someone do a Docker demo and they, they install Docker and then they run some kind of Hello World app and it starts spitting stuff out and you're like, cool, I don't really know what happened behind the scenes. Um, this is what happened behind the scenes. Somebody predefined what dependencies they need, what version of uh, software, what version of um, you know Python, PHP, whatever it may be, Ruby, and um, they told what to execute. Maybe that was a Ruby file, maybe that was some kind of system command, and when you run it, Docker will take all those dependencies and run them. So this is great, but this is actually something I stole from the Debian documentation online, and that is new shiny syndrome. So many of us, many of us suffer from this. Some of us are recovering addicts, but um, you know, new shiny syndrome is kind of oh, the latest and greatest, and it's like, wow, this Docker is cool. We should be doing it. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's talking about it. You know, I want to optimize my build as much as possible. So there are some uh, pros and cons on when you may or may not want to use this. So when would you want to use containers? Well. If your app has to run on multiple systems, this is sort of like the big company problem or the scalability problem, right? Uh, you don't want to have to deal with specifying OS versions and installing Apache and doing all that when you have hundreds of servers that you need to scale your app to. It's a lot easier to build this one Docker image that has everything predefined and you can simply run that on every um, VM that you have. Uh, uh, similarly, if you have multiple different apps that need to run on run system, run on one system, it provides a really clear-cut way of separating these apps. Um, you know, I could have four different versions of Python. Maybe one is a legacy, one is the latest and greatest, and I'm running four different apps on this system. I could run four different copies of Apache on the same system. You know, that solves a lot of headaches rather than having to have everything running under one giant Apache that's just going to leak memory like a sieve. <laughs> um, distribute a fully working app to other systems or other users. So yeah, maybe you do have many servers and you want to just push your app to them without having to reprovision everything. You could push this Docker image. Uh, similarly, if you recall back to the example uh, Docker file, this Python 3.6 is someone else's Docker image that I'm pulling in. So you can have images that reference other images. So uh, that's a use case right there to use Docker if you want something to be a little bit more reusable. Maybe I have an app and I'm trying to uh, share it with my customers. It's a lot easier for my customers to just say from, you know, you know Vince's app bam, it's right here and running, rather than having to say, oh, how do I build this? How do I, you know, st how do I start? Get, what do I have to do to get started? 
when not to use containers, I, I think that there still are many cases where the overhead of learning this technology and going through this build process is really just not worth it. Um, if you have one app on one system, then you might not gain very much by, by using Docker. Um, if you have system dependencies that don't get upgraded frequently or don't get changed frequently, <clears throat> then you know, you're probably not going to benefit very much from being able to sort of freeze images in time that Docker provides. And similarly, if your app is not getting distributed to other users or other systems, if it's your company website and you only, you know, push a code change, you know, once a month maybe, and you really, it really doesn't matter what version of Apache you're using as long as something is running it, you know, you might not really benefit very much from containers. So there are, there are pros and cons to, to using it. Um, that being said, I'm, I, that's all the slides that I had. Um, I do have a demo. I wasn't really planning on doing it, but I would like to open it up to questions. If you have any questions or any comments about um, just the technology in general. Yes. Yes, you can have uh, multiple processes going in a Docker image. Uh, another way to do it is you could have multiple separate Docker images that all run in sync. So you can actually create, it, say uh, a standard use case would be, I have a database one that is running MySQL. So that's its own image. And I have a separate uh, image that is running my website. And they will communicate with each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a great way to kind of, uh, you know, put things in boxes and not to pick on legacy applications, but if you do have a legacy application, uh, Docker is actually a great way to kind of just put that in a box and run it in tandem with all of your other more modern applications rather than having to provision completely separate infrastructure for it. So that's another good use case. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, I couldn't really answer that offhand. Um, I know that Docker is has very good Linux support. Um, Windows is a good example. So if you wanted to have a Windows container. I believe that that can be done just very recently. Microsoft has started, I mean, Microsoft has really thrown their backing behind Docker. Um, but if you wanted to run a Windows app in a Docker container, that might get a little funky. I'm not sure what the support is yet. Similar to some other systems, if you wanted to run a BSD style app in a container, I'm not quite sure what the support would be. Um, it's very much kind of Linux oriented at this point. Okay, I uh, believe there is limited hardware support, so you can map certain devices in and out of the box, uh, in and out of the container. Uh, similarly, you can map file systems, so you could share a file system from the host and sort of map it into the container dynamically at runtime. If you did have like a shared code directory or some sort of shared, um, you know, network file system or something like that, you could map it from the host to the yeah, devices. I'm not 100% sure on. Yes. Yeah, that's partially true, but you can you can start pretty much at any level and uh some images are sort of black box, some images they do publish the code from um, some are, a, a lot of uh, companies will officially publish a Docker image, so you could count that as maybe a trusted source. Um, you know, like uh, the Python Software Foundation, I, I, I wouldn't want you to quote me on this, but I, I, I think that they might publish some of their own Python images. Um, you know, so that's sort of a trusted source. Alternatively, you could start with something a lot lower level, 
like a sort of a base level Ubuntu image and then install Python there. Um, so, or you could go all the way back and build your own from scratch. That might get a little bit uh, tinkering under the hood, but yeah. Anything else? Yes. That's a great question, and that was one of the struggles that we initially had is like, okay, how do I handle security updates in this container? And uh, the, the key thing to think about is that containers and uh, images to some degree are very much disposable. You want them to be a complete snapshot in time. You don't want to be running pip uh, install dash dash upgrade within your image because now it's no longer frozen in time. So the solution would be you would create a new image. So I might have an image called my app version 1.2. And say there's a critical, you know, open SSL vulnerability or something, I could create a my app version 1.2 dash open SSL fix. And that would be a completely separate image. And I would then push that out to whatever host is running my Docker containers. I would shut down the old containers, throw them away create some new containers from this new image. So it's very much like a snapshot in time. And that's how you would handle the security updates. Yes? <clears throat> Great, so um, specific to containers, you can manage them exactly the same as you would normally. Uh, if you have an environment variable, you can uh, pass that in in your uh, Docker file. You could pass in an environment variable that gets set and sort of stored in that image. Um, you could do it dynamically at runtime. So when you're when you're running um, when you're running a Docker run my image, you could pass in uh, and say, "I want to map uh, my secret on this current host." to my secret inside of this uh, image, and it will do that at runtime. So you could basically treat it exactly the same as you would uh, on any other system. Yes? Yeah, agreed. Um, that's a good question. Uh, for something like that, I, I probably wouldn't want to have a, a uh, MySQL container that maps the file in, especially if I have like three or four MySQL containers. I wouldn't want them all sharing the same files. Um, if you have something like a, so a good example is, if you're working on one app and it's carefully managed, you can ship a separate version of each image uh, or a separate image for each version of your app You know, after you make a commit. But if you're dealing with something like WordPress, where it's very much dynamic and some user is going to log in and all these plugins are going to start updating themselves and it's all file based, uh, then you might want to consider not actually having the code inside the container and that could go to a, a shared file system, uh, especially if you have like a load balanced environment. So you can kind of pick and choose how you want to handle it. it it's this going to be the same problem as if you had two separate servers with like related to file locking. Uh, but generally, the idea behind containers is that you're, you're going to put everything in there sort of statically. So uh, yeah, you could map to maybe a secrets file or something like that that's on the host. That would be a good way to do it. That way, you're not actually shipping it in your container. Yes? Yes, uh, you, that's where you would want to put it because then it only is going to run pip install dash r requirements.txt when you build the image. And you could install that image a thousand times in the future. It's never going to rerun pip because it already was run and stored into the image. Uh, good point, good point. So. Yes, uh, Docker Hub is sort of the one true source to, to load these things. It's like GitHub for the Docker world. Um, you can create your own, and that's called a registry. It's a Docker uh, a container registry. If you are, 
you could host your own internally if you have private things at your company. Um, the image is sort of like a binary with some config files, so you can do it directly that way if you wanted to. Um, but the recommended way would be to upload it to a Docker Hub. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, if there aren't any other questions, then uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me know if you have any feedback or uh, you know any other ideas. I love to stay in touch with people. Thank you.